Hello online. Welcome. Glad that you're here this morning. Welcome to our summer series, Hall of Faith, based out of Hebrews chapter 11. In keeping with the theme that the Lord gave Foundation Church earlier this year, the idea is to look at probably one, if not the greatest, one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible on building our faith. Last Sunday, Dee Sokolowski gave a powerful message about his faith pilgrimage as a young man in his college years. And then he talked about that faith and that pilgrimage on into his vocational life. And it was a very, very powerful message. He shared the incredible story of his interacting with Pastor Michael Todd and the Transformation Center and and how faith was a big part of that and how millions of dollars were raised and miraculous things God did and and faith's part in seeing those things come to reality. I, I hope that you've had a chance to see that message. If you haven't, you can see it on our Facebook page. It is really worth watching and worth listening to as you see some of the things that God is doing in our city in our lifetime. And these things need to be paid attention to and reflected on. Uh, One of the things that Dee said in his message last Sunday toward the end that I want to try to bring a little clarity to this morning uh, is this. Last Sunday, if you were here or you watched the message online, we had the model sitting right here and we had a camera that looked down on the model. And you may be saying, well, what model is he talking about? It's the model that we designed 20 years ago when we first bought this property and we built this first building. If you look at the model today, there's actually three buildings on that model. You look at the land, there's one of three buildings on the land today. And so what I want to do this morning is try to be as crystal clear and transparent as I possibly can so that you're not confused about what's happening and what's next and that sort of thing. Uh, Let me be very clear. We are not going to build another building anytime soon that I know of. Can I say it that way? Uh, God has not told me, he's not told our other pastors, our staff, our elders that we're getting ready to build another building. And so we just felt like we needed to clarify that because it'd be very easy to go, oh, I see what they're doing. They bring the heavy hitter in, a banker. He says, hey, let's build another building. I'll loan you some more money and everybody will be fat, dumb, and happy. That's not, that's not what's happening at all. So let me just be clear, we do not sense that God is asking us to build another building at this time. If he chooses to, that's great, and we'll try to follow him in faith, and he'll be the one that makes that happen. But what we're not going to do is jump up and go, hey, everybody, let's pitch in and let's build another building because we think it's a good idea. Listen, I've lived long enough and pastored long enough to tell you that that scares me to death. Uh, We are very, very interested in knowing what God is saying, listening to what God is saying, and obeying what God says. God can do anything He wants to do. I hope you know that by now in your life. And so if He wants to build a building, multiple buildings, that's up to Him. All I'm saying is, as one of the pastors here at this point in time, He has not indicated that to the leadership of the church that He's the head of. So, relax. Relax if you're wondering, okay? And uh, stay tuned. We'll see what God does in the future. Now, I know... That school is out for the summer. I know that. But can I go ahead and give you a little pop quiz this morning? Would that be okay? So here's a pop quiz for you. It's just one question. You'll probably do okay. Can you name any of the characters listed in Hebrews chapter 11 as examples of faith? Anybody? Raise your hand. Let me see. Let me call on somebody. Anybody in Hebrews chapter 11 that is one of the characters? Landon, I saw an almost. What does that mean? You're not sure? Okay, we'll get back. I bet your dad can tell you one. Liz. Abraham. Abraham, Very good. He's in there prominently. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Enoch. Enoch. Anybody else? Moses. Abel. Abel. She's on her phone. Uh, Let me go down the list here. (laughs) Anybody else? Noah. Noah. Exactly. There are several prominent characters in the hall of faith, and that's why they're in there, because they demonstrate a great faith in their life, and they're a list of people that God has used. Today, what I want to do is introduce you to some uh, or a lesser known one of those characters in the Bible in Hebrews 11. In fact, he only has one verse in this story, and I want to share that with you. Uh, How many of you have ever heard of Enoch? You heard about him just a while ago? Yeah, if you were paying attention. Enoch. How many of you have ever heard an entire sermon on Enoch? Me neither. Me neither. And yet, he is in this hall of faith uh, and as an example of somebody that we can look to and learn from that will increase and encourage our faith. So, I'm in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. If you have your Bible or you want to follow along with a smart device... That is fantastic. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. 
For by it, the men and women of old gained approval. They obtained a good testimony. In verse 3, it continues. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Now, that's some raw power right there, isn't it? To take nothing and make something out of nothing. That's exactly what this says. That's what God did. He created everything there is by the word of his mouth, by his own sheer power, by his willingness to speak it into existence. That's what God did. That's how powerful our God is. And the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, we know this is what happened because it's throughout the Bible. And so then he starts giving examples of men who li- and women who live by faith. In verse 4, he said, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Then we come to the lone verse about Enoch in chapter 11 of Hebrews, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Now, Enoch's story is actually told in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. It's in chapter 5. It's brief. I'm going to read it to you. This is the entirety of the story of Enoch according to the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, it says this, Enoch lived 65 years and he became the father of Methuselah. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were, the, were 365. So Enoch lived a year for every day of a year. Got it? That's free. I'm not charging for that. I'm, I'm just going to give that to you. Okay. Verse 24 says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. God took him. Enoch was one of only two people in the entire Bible that never experienced death. There was another guy that didn't experience death. Do you know who that was? Landon, you got this one? Elijah, Elijah exactly. You remember what happened in Elijah's case? Elijah's living his life, doing his ministry. One day, a fiery chariot comes down out of heaven and picks that dude up and takes him away. That actually happened. That is amazing. That's the God that we're worshiping this morning. That's the God we're singing to this morning. That's the God that we praise and that we're praying to. The same God that took Elijah away by fire is the same God that we're serving and following today. Amen? That's fantastic. So back to Enoch. It says that he obtained the witness. In other words, he gained approval. Enoch was pleasing to God before the law. Now, If you know anything about the Bible, in the Old Testament, the law was given to Moses. Somebody mentioned him. He's in this Hebrews chapter 11 also. And God gave Moses the law basically to show his people Israel how to live and how to follow him. Enoch pleased God before the law was given. Enoch pleased God before there existed a set of standards by which to please God. That's pretty fascinating, isn't it? How did he do that, you say? Well, I don't know, but apparently there was some faith involved in his walking with God. That's how he wound up in this Hebrews Hall of Faith. Question for you. What do you think the world was like in Enoch's day? You said, that's a crazy question. How in the world would I know? Well, did you know that Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah? What was the world like in Noah's day? It was terrible. It was so bad and so wicked that God decided to destroy the world and start over again. And that's exactly what he did. What's the point? The point is this. Can we choose to be and live differently than the culture and the world in which we live? Enoch did. And if you're taking notes this morning, this is your first fill-in if you want to. Enoch's life shows us that we can be and live differently than the culture and the world around us. We can be and live differently than the culture and the world around us. In fact, when you think about it, isn't that what Jesus invited us to do? When Jesus said things like, hey, I want you to be salt and I want you to be light, what is he talking about when he asks us to be salt and light? He's asking us to be different than the world around us. 
See, here's what he's saying, and this is what the New Testament, the whole Bible actually teaches this. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, they receive that per, the, the person of Jesus Christ, their identity changes. They, a new, they become a new person from the inside out. And so now they have new ways of thinking, new ways of speaking, new values, new things are important to them, new ways of conducting business. Everything becomes new when we meet Jesus Christ. And so we are actually far better than we used to be. And so we live in the culture as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, and we're to be in this world that we live in. We can't not be in the world we live in. We're in it, but we're not supposed to be immersed in it. In other words, if I'm a Christian, I should not look exactly like a non-Christian. I should be different. I should look different. I should think different. I should speak different. I should act different. I should make different decisions because I have a new identity. A person who's lost that doesn't have a relationship with God through his son Jesus does not have that same identity. He or she does not have the power to change, but I do. And that's what Jesus is saying. I want you to be like salt. I want you to be like light. You're not better than anybody because you're a Christian, but you're better off than people who aren't Christians. And part of the reason we're here is to exist in the world and in the culture we live in, like Enoch lived in his day, and we are to show people a better way to live. Do you see that? That's what the Bible is teaching, and that's what we see in Enoch's life. In thinking about Enoch's life, his testimony is somewhat different than the other examples in Hebrews 11. Abel did something. Noah built something. Abraham offered something. David slew something. And the list goes on and on and on. And what you find if you read this list, this fascinating chapter of faith, is that these men and women of old, they faced unique challenges and they had to give unique faith. And they gave their faith to God. They made themselves available. They expressed faith in God. And then God did miraculous things. And that's the point of Hebrews chapter 11. But when you come to Enoch's life, not so much. Enoch is an example of someone who pleased God by faith, yet there are no examples of what he did. He demonstrated faith not by some great feat, but in his daily walk with God for 365 years, and that pleased God. It pleased God enough to get Enoch in the hall of faith. So what does that have to do with you? Will you ever be called upon to build an ark? Will you ever be called upon to offer up your son in sacrifice? Will you ever be called upon to deliver millions of people? Maybe. But perhaps Enoch is an example of a man who loved God and lived a simple faith in God, unbeknownst to the rest of the world, but not unbeknownst to God. God knew. God knew. And I want to say to you, watch this. This will escape you. This will go right over and you. It won't even register. But do you realize that today you are walking with the same God that Enoch walked with thousands of years ago? It's the same God. It's not somebody else. It's not God 2.0. This is the same God that Enoch served and followed. That is amazing when you think about it, okay? It is amazing. And why do you think this might be such good news? Well, have you thought about it like this? God must love ordinary people. He must love ordinary people. Why? Because he created so many of us. And if you think about it, in your lifetime, you ne may never be called upon to demonstrate extraordinary faith. You know, miraculous, army defeating, ark building, you know, giant slaying kind of faith. You may never be called on to demonstrate that kind of faith in your life. Now, here's what I believe is probably true. You probably will at seasons of your life, certain decisions and things you go through, you're going to have to demonstrate a greater faith or a little more faith than your ordinary days of life. That's likely. That's likely. But you know what? Choosing to live a simple life of faith in God and his promises, that pleases God in its own way. It pleases God in its own way. I want to try to explain the difference between two concepts for you. And I want to try to explain the difference between God loving you and you pleasing God. First, God loving you. What does that mean? What does it mean to say that God loves you? Well, it means what it says, God loves you. God loves you based on what he did. It's a decision he made. When did he start loving you? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says that God loved you before he founded the world. So long before you were born, way before you were conceived, God already made the decision to love you. 
That should be good news to you. It sure is good news to me. He's not up in heaven trying to decide about you. He's not still waiting to see what you do or what you give up in order to decide whether he loves you or not. He made the decision before you breathed your first breath that he would love you by his choice. He loves you. It's based on him. It's based on what he does. Now, when it comes to pleasing God, that's based on what you do. Somebody might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves? Yeah, that's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. What comes after 9? Not a trick question. 10. 10. Yeah. What does Ephesians 2, 10 say? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in those things that God has prepared. So here's the point. There are things that God wants to do in your life and through your life that are ordinary everyday things that when you do those things, you're living by faith. And it may not, again, it may not be the extraordinary millions of dollars and miraculous and big stuff. It can be. God can do those things. And it's not you and me that brings apart or brings those things around. But it's God that brings those things around. I was thinking about Dee's story last week, and he was talking about Michael Todd and, you know, how the Transformation Center and how that church is blowing and going and all the miraculous and all that. Did you pay attention to the order of the story, though? Did Michael Todd wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm going to buy the Spirit Center, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to build all this, and I'm going to buy these businesses, and we're going to have millions of dollars, we're going to pay it off in the first year? Did Michael Todd wake up one day and say he was going to do all that? Not according to the story. The story goes that God approached him in the bedroom of his daughter and said, this is what I'm about to do. This is what I'm going to give you. So, and that's why I kind of go back to our situation in our building here. If God wants to build whatever he wants to build out there, he can build it. But it will be God that initiates that. Not Michael Todd, not me, not Dee Sokolowski. It's something that God will do. In the ordinary, everyday things of your life, going to work, going to school, raising your family, paying your bills, doing the stuff you do, it takes faith. And God has, in the midst of you you living your life, he has prepared some things for you to do. And when we do those things, it's actually pleasing to God. I'm going to try to illustrate this in a way that might help make sense of this. My wife, Kim, and I are the parents of two grown children, Alexander and Grace Ann. And we love our children. We're not still trying to decide about do we love them or not, you know. We're not waiting to see their performance to decide if we love them or not. We love our son and our daughter. It's a settled fact. It's not up for negotiation. But can our son or our daughter do things that please us or displease us? Yeah, what might our children do that displease us? Well, they might lie to us. Anybody here like to be lied to ever about anything? No. Our children might disrespect us. They might dishonor us. They might treat each other poorly. Those are examples of things that don't necessarily please us. Doesn't change the fact that we love them, but it doesn't necessarily please us. By the same token, can our children make decisions that actually please us as their parents? Absolutely. If you're a parent, you know this, right? If you're a grandparent, well, I don't know about grandparents. (laughs) As grandparents, we can take leave of our senses sometimes. But anyway... In general, we love our children, we love our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, that's a settled fact. But sometimes our children can do things that please us as well, like they can treat each other well, they can respect each other, they can show gratitude, they can be kind to other people. My wife was telling me a story, I hope I can do this, it's not that big a deal, but it, it illustrates the point. My wife was telling me the story last night that she and our daughter... Grace Ann went to Lowe's yesterday to buy some flowers. And um, so they're, they're, and they've got Jax and Knox. Jax is two, Knox is seven weeks. So here's my wife. and They're like a parade going down through Lowe's. Anyway, they get to the checkout counter. They're standing in line. There's a man standing parallel in the line beside them. And this fella inadvertently knocks over an entire display of suckers. Okay? So if you're the man, what's the first thing you feel? You're embarrassed. You're embarrassed. You're wondering, who in the heck saw me do that? What an idiot. I mean, you know, you have this dialogue within yourself. And 
my daughter could have, you know, she could have said anything to herself, poor fella, or you loser, or whatever. She could have had that dialogue with herself in her mind. Or she could have said, you know what, we've got a two-year-old and a baby. We're in line. We got places to go and stuff to do. We don't have time to fool with this. But the first thing she did was she jumped down and she started helping picking up all the suckers. You say, well, man, you're just taking an opportunity to brag on your kids. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the part I want you to see. The pleasure. As my wife was telling that story last night, the pleasure I could see in her eyes as she was talking about it. Our kids can do things to please us. We can do things likewise to please God, our Heavenly Father. If you're taking notes, it's time for another one. There's two kinds of faith, basically. Two kinds of faith. Saving and living. Let me explain them. By the way, if you're looking and you go, oh, he skipped one. Enoch is a great example of everyday faith. I'll give that to you. Saving faith is when a person hears the gospel, however many times they've heard it, and it clicks for them. It, the, the light comes on and they go, you know what? I'm a sinner and my sin offends God and I need to be saved. And the only one that can save me is Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to invite him to come into my life and save me. And I'm going to receive him as my savior and accept what he did on the cross and his burial and his resurrection as payment for my sin. He got what I deserve, but I believe he died for me and rose again. I receive him as my savior. That's saving faith. Then there's something called living faith. What is living faith? Once you're saved, you begin living by faith. You pick up right there and you begin living by faith. There are lots of verses in the Bible that speak to this, but one of the clearest I know of is Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6 says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, how did you receive Him? By grace through faith. We talked about it earlier, Right? You received him by grace through faith. That took faith. That's saving faith. In the same breath, in the same verse, the apostle Paul wrote, so now walk in him. In other words, that literally means, the Greek word means, lead your life following him. It's not just something you, you know, you get saved and you go, I got it from here. I'm going to take it from here, Jesus. I'll, I'll be good. If I need you, I'll holler on you. You know, I'll, I'll catch up with you. But otherwise, I've got it from here. That's not at all what the Bible teaches. You receive Jesus Christ as Savior, which takes faith, and then you follow him by faith. It takes faith to follow Jesus Christ, and that's what this verse is telling us. And the idea is that God wants us to follow him by faith daily. How often do you live your life? Every day. How often does the Bible say that God wants us to live by faith, do you think? Every day. Every day faith, that's what we're talking about. This morning. How many of you have ever heard the scripture, this one right here? The righteous person shall live by faith. The righteous person shall live by faith. You ever heard that? Anybody? Yeah, okay, not a trick. It's found in Romans, it's found in Galatians, it's found in Hebrews. And all three of those new te- or books of the New Testament, they're actually a reference to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. I know you've been reading that lately. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. So if you combine the verses of Scripture, you combine these two Scriptures. Listen to this. The righteous person shall live by faith, and without faith it is impossible to please God. What do you get when you get those two verses combined? Well, it sounds like the only time God is pleased with us is when we're living by faith. Seems so, doesn't it? But have you ever thought about how your faith is part of your everyday life? How your faith is part of your everyday life? Think about it. Does it take faith to believe in God at all? Yes, yes it does. Let's, answer, let's let the Bible answer that. And Donna, here's what the Bible says. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. It takes faith just to believe that God exists according to the Bible, right? So it's not just a foregone conclusion. It's not just a given. It takes faith to believe that there is a God at all. By the way, how often do you believe that there's a God? Do you do that once in your life? 
Do you stop? Do you believe one day and then one day you go, not anymore? It's every day. You wake up every day and you live your daily life. And once again, you reaffirm the fact, whether you tell yourself this or not, you still, you live by faith that day. You still trust that what was true yesterday is what? It's true today. That's exactly right. Listen, does it take faith to believe that you can actually have a relationship with a supreme being that you've never seen, you've never touched, you've never heard an audible word from him? Is, does it take faith to believe that you can not just know about him, as the Bible says demons do, but that you can actually have a relationship with him? Does that take faith? Yeah. Absolutely. Does it take faith to believe in the 7,000 promises that are listed in the Bible for the people who are followers of God. Does that take faith? Yeah, that's about number, reason number 7,000 that we encourage you week after week after week after week to do what? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. You don't read your Bible because that is going to you know, help God out. You read your Bible to find out what's in it. You read your Bible to find out what it says. You read your Bible to claim your inheritance. You have so much that's available to you. And you've got to make yourself available to God so that God can make his promises available to you. There's a lot of things he wants to give you. There's a lot of things he wants to do in your life. It takes faith, though. It takes faith to believe in God. It takes faith to believe that those promises are in the Bible. And it takes faith to approach God and say, hey, maybe there's something in here for me. And there absolutely is. That takes faith. Let me ask you this. Does it take faith to pray to God, to talk to God, and believe that he's actually there, and he's listening to you, and he cares about what's going on in your life, and he will answer every single prayer you ever pray? Does that take faith? So this is not, you know, so weird or, you know, out there or it's like, well, certain people, the really elite super Christians, they have faith, but I, I not myself, I, I don't have that much faith. Yeah, you do. You see, it takes faith every day, everyday faith to believe in and follow Jesus Christ. And there are so many examples. I want to give you one this morning, a couple maybe. Let's take the area of marriage. Many of you are married, okay? And so does the Bible tell us anything about being married successfully? Does it say anything at all? Yes or no? Absolutely. It has a lot to say. One place we can go that's probably one of the more famous, if you will, is Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul wrote this verse. He said, husbands, love your wives. Does that sound like a good idea? Ladies, I would expect you to say that's a really good idea. Amen. <laughs> husbands, love your wives. Okay, well, how do I do that? What does that look like? To what extent, to what standard am I supposed to love my wife? The rest of the verse says that as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that's how we're supposed to love our wives. In other words, we're supposed to love our wives sacrificially. And so you're sitting there saying to yourself or you're watching online, that sounds pretty tough. I'm not sure I can do that. I'd like to do it. I believe that's in the Bible. I believe God wants me to do that. But the truth of the matter is I'm just not sure I can actually do that. Or I might be able to do it for a little bit, but I don't know about a week. I don't know about a day. I don't know about an hour, or I might be able to love my wife in this area, and this area, and this area, but this area is off limits. I can't do it in that area. And you have a challenge, don't you? You're presented with a conundrum. God says, love your wife uh, as Christ loves the church. And so now you want to do that. You know you're supposed to do that, but you know yourself. You know you can't do it, and you can't keep it up if you can do it even for a little while, right? So what do you do? Here's what you do. You make yourself available. You go into this knowing that, God, you told me to love my wife sacrificially. I'm not even sure how to do that. But here we go. Alarm goes off and we start our day. And so what does that look like for you? I do not know. And if we interviewed every husband in this room right now, and those of you watching online, it would look a little bit different for each man. Because each man is married to a different woman. Amen? Are you with me? Come on. Listen, I'm talking. Are you listening? Let's go. Let's do this thing. This is not complicated. In fact, it's so simple, you'll go, oh, well, yeah, I already knew that. Why do I even need to listen? Just listen. Just see if God doesn't say something to you in this. So you can't do it, but you know you're supposed to. And so what you do is you make yourself available. You show up and you say, God, I'm willing to love my wife. Not sure how, not sure what she needs, but here we go. And so you walk into it. You make yourself available. And here's what you find. At your point of obedience, 
That's where God meets you. And that's where he supplies what you need. You say, I don't know how he's going to do it. I'm not even sure I want to do it. I know I'm supposed to do it. So God, here we go. I'm going to try. I'm going to try again. I'm going to try to love my wife as you love the church. I'm going to try to love sacrificially. So what does God do? He meets you at your point of availability, your point of obedience. What does he do at your point of obedience? Let me share another one of those promises with you. How about this one? Have you ever heard this? And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Who's going to supply your need? You are, right? No, you're not. You have some. You can meet some of your needs, but you can't meet them all. God will supply all your needs. Why isn't there a list of needs? Why isn't there a list of things that God says that he will provide? Why? How long would the list have to be to provide all the needs that you need and all, of all the cultures, of all people, of all time, how long would that list have to be? Could you even think up the list? Could you make a comprehensive list that would cover everything that's going to be needed to live by faith? No. We couldn't. So what does Paul write? Inspired by the Holy Spirit, written by God, through, written by man, through God through man, he wrote this, my God shall supply all your needs. Which ones? Which ones? All of them. All of them. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is rich. How rich is he? Nothing exists outside of him. Everything is his. You're his. That chair you're sitting in, your shoes are his, Scott. Everything is his. Everything is his. He has everything, and he can give everything. And he, he's the one, remember, we talked about at the beginning, that can speak things to, into existence that don't even exist. So if he needs something that's not there, all he's got to do is will it to be, and it will be. He will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And some of you sitting there saying to yourself, some of you watching online, well, I'm not married. So what does that have to do with me? So even if you're not married, are you still called to love people? What's the greatest commandment in the Bible? Do you know? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. And what? Love your neighbor as yourself. There's the standard. Love them as much as you love yourself. Paul comes along in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he gives a description. It's not comprehensive. It's not all-inclusive. But he says, here's some things that characterize love. You want to know how to love? Here's how you are to love people. Love is patient. How are you with that one? Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. Love's unselfish. Love keeps no record of wrong. Doesn't keep score. How are we doing? So you look at this list and you say, okay, I'm a human and I'm called to love other humans that way. How long are you going to be able to keep that up on your own? I'm not going to do very well with that. You're not going to do very well with that. So you get frustrated and you shut the book and you close it down because you can't do it. You can't live up to that standard. And God knows you can't. And so what are you going to do? By faith, you're going to say, God, this is what you say. This is what's written. This is what you expect. This is what you want of me. I'm pretty sure I can't do it. But here I go. I'm going to obey you as best as I understand. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to be patient. I'm going to try to be kind. I'm going to try these things. And what's going to happen is you're going to fall short, and you know you are, but your obedience, making yourself available as you step into it, at your point of obedience, what's going to happen? God's going to show up. He's going to meet you. He's going to honor your faith, and he's going to give you what you need. Everything you need. But you can't do it without him. But you don't have to. Life requires faith every day. Every day. And your everyday faith pleases God. But did you know it does something else? It causes something else? Back in Hebrews chapter 6 or 11, verse 6 says this that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. God is a rewarder of those who who seek Him. Isn't that good news? <laughs> How
How might God reward your faith? Any way he wants to. As much as he wants to. And so he does. And your faith pleases God. And that's part of the wonder and the joy of living by faith. When you realize that God is actually paying attention to you. He is actually seeing you demonstrate your faith. Making yourself available. It not only pleases him. He's going to meet you at that point of obedience. And he's actually going to reward you. He's going to reward you, not because I think it's a good idea, not because I said so, but because his Bible, his word, his own word, which represents his character. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to reward you. How? All the ways that you need to be rewarded. All the ways that God chooses to reward you, he will reward you. Here's a statement for you. How many ways do you suppose an infinite being with no limits, who loves you unconditionally, can reward your everyday faith. See it on the screen. How many ways do you suppose an infinite being with no limits, who loves you unconditionally, can reward your everyday faith? It's what we're talking about. So the question is, as we prepare to close this morning, are you living by faith? Are you living by faith? And maybe you're living by faith more than you thought. Congratulations. God is pleased. God will continue to reward your faith. And the context of this story is that Enoch served God, walked with God, pleased God till the end of his time on earth. And the lesson for us is that we are called to follow in the example of Enoch. Live by faith. Live by faith. Again... As we said earlier, your faith can lead you to live, to be and live differently than the whole world around you. Your faith is required for us to be different, to be salt and to be light. And it's not that we're obnoxious about it. It's not that, hey, I'm better than you. It's not that we're judgmental. It's that we realize where we were and who we were and what God has done for us and where we are now and what he's doing for us. And we recognize how better off we are. And we want to live that way. And we want to show other people a better way to live. That's the point here. And your everyday faith may never be spectacular, miracle working, grandiose, big stuff. And so you can very easily say to yourself, well, I guess I must not be that good of a Christian. I must not love God that much because nothing big like that's ever going to happen in my life. That's not true. Enoch pleased God by his simple faith, simply following God. Simply loving God. Simply pleasing God. Nothing spectacular. And he did it his whole lifetime. And he pleased God so much, it got him in the Hall of Fame, Hall of Faith. That's you and me. We can live that way. We're called to live that way. We're invited to live that way. With that in mind, let me me share an opportunity with you to live by faith. The leadership of Foundation Church, our pastors and elders, we believe that God is calling our church to begin a second morning worship service on Sundays. We believe we're supposed to start August the 1st. That's 48 days from now. And that's, that's what we believe that he's saying to us. What, what is our mission as a church? It, it's the same as it was last week. Let me hear it. Exactly. To help people find and follow Jesus. Extending to two worship services, by the way, I don't know from your seat what if you could see very well in this room, but from my spot in the room, what I can tell you is this room is at least 70% full. The thing about American culture is this. We'll go places and we'll do things and we'll set through events as long as the room's about 70% full. When it hits 70, we're done. What we'll do is we'll hit the lid, we'll go back down. We'll hit the lid, we'll go back down. Until something changes, 70% capacity is capacity. So we're pretty much there. And the interesting thing is, this is the beginning of summer. Summer officially starts next Sunday, as you know. And instead of our attendance going down, which usually happens to churches in the summertime, our attendance is actually rising. That's God. That's not us. It's not our incredible programming and planning and brilliant, you know, uh, programming. and all. It's not us. It's what God's doing. And so 
We're going to help people, more people find and follow Jesus. And so here's the thing. We're going to widen the net. It's going to present the church double the opportunities to share the gospel, share the truth, double the opportunities to show the love of Jesus Christ, double all those things, right? And it's going to require something. It's going to require more. More what? More planning, more work, more rehearsals, more energy, more communication, more understanding, more money, more involvement. And it's going to require faith of you. You say, how is it going to require faith of me? I want to ask you to do this. And so I, I did this on my note. Take your, if you got one of these, these handouts, and turn it to the other side. There's, you're going to go, well, what am I doing this for? I want to ask you, we want to ask you to start praying for three things three things. You say, well, I can't remember all those. Let me just tell you what they are. I'll tell you one at a time and you start praying. And here's the thing. Trust the Holy Spirit to bring to your remembrance what he wants you to pray about. But here's what I want to ask you to pray about. Foundation Church. You can put FC. Prayer number one, FC. Pray for Foundation Church. You say, well, what do you want us to pray for Foundation Church? Well, you can pray for unity. You can pray for the leadership. You can pray for whatever the Holy Spirit directs you to pray for. But this is going to require more of everything for us to do this. More work's going to be involved, as I said, all those things. Pray for us that we stay unified, that we keep listening to God, that we keep obeying God, and we don't get full of ourselves. Hey, our church is growing. Look at us. We're better than. No, we're not. The church is growing because God grows the church. We don't grow the church. We only do things to set the stage, but he's the one that causes us to dance. Amen? Amen. So we're going to do that as best we understand. We'll set the stage. Number two, pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. You say, well, what should I pray for myself? Here's what I would like for you to pray for yourself. Ask God this question. Ask God this question. God, how do you want me to be involved? How do you want me to be involved? Pray for yourself, God, how do you want me to be involved? And then third, pray for others. Pray for others. We're doing this, again, to widen the net so that more people will have more opportunities to come in and hear the gospel and be loved on by the church. That's us. So pray for Foundation Church. Pray for yourself pray for others. You say, well, I, how's that going to take faith of me? Well, let me just say this. If I can be kind, I'll try to be as diplomatic as I know how. It's not going to require any faith of you if you decide to do nothing. It won't. I mean, if you decide, well, that's what they're doing and that church I go to and I attend, that's what they decided to do and maybe I'll come, maybe I won't. That's not going to require any faith of you to walk through the door and just sort of sit down and take it all in. That's a good start, but that's not a good stay. It's going to take faith for you to pray for us. It's going to take faith for you to pray and sincerely ask God, hey God, I'm available. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to be involved in this? I would be shocked if you got silence, radio silence. God has nothing to do with you. And it's going to take faith to reach out to other people and invite them to what God is doing here. Or it won't. But I can tell you this. If you don't express faith, if you don't make yourself available to God, what's going to happen is you're going to be safe and secure and God's still going to love you because he settled that before the foundation of the world. But you're going to miss out. You're going to miss out on what God is going to do. You're going to miss out on what God wants to do in your life. And through your life. And folks, last I checked, that's part of the reason we're still here. Everyday faith. Everyday faith. Keep doing it. Pastor Rob, come and share. Hey, give him another hand. Two in the same day. So everyone say faith. When was the last time your faith was tested? Every day. I remember in the morning watching Ollie and his dad, they were praying over each other. And that moment when Ollie said yes to Jesus, it took faith, faith like a child. When Sequoia was sitting right there on the front row, and he said yes to Jesus. I believe there's people in this room that need to say yes to Jesus. I believe there's people in this room that need to say yes to being obedient 
and falling in believer's baptism. So if I can invite you to close your eyes. And we're just going to pray to God. Master of the universe. Creator. Maybe you're in this room today and you said, Rob, I listened to Scott's sermon. I don't have that kind of faith because I don't know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm only talking to the men and women, boys and girls, that have never said yes to Jesus. If you said yes to Jesus, this is your time to start praying for the people that have not entered into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're here today, you're saying, Rob, that's me. I wanna give my life to Christ today. Well, first you gotta repent. You gotta talk to God, which is prayer. You gotta just talk to him. Say, God, forgive me of all the bad things I've done. I admit I'm a sinner. I can't have my old life, Lord, and you, Jesus. Next, you gotta believe. You gotta believe with your whole heart that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to save and rescue you. Then you commit your life to following him every single day. It takes faith. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Rob, that's me. If that's you, I wanna invite you into a prayer and you're gonna pray and you're gonna invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and your Savior. So repeat after me. Say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of all the bad things I've done. I repent. I believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose to save and rescue me. In the best way I know how, I turn my back on my old life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you just said that prayer, you just gave your life to the Lord. We say this all the time, this is a safe place. I'm not gonna embarrass you, I'm not gonna call you out, I'm not gonna do anything. I just wanna make eye contact with you. So if you'll look up at me, if you said that prayer, you just gave your life to the Lord. If you're looking at me, you're saying, Rob, I said that prayer. I gave my life to the Lord. So your next step, there's a card, it's a connection card. I want you to grab that card. Can you grab the card? Thanks. What I want you to do is I want you to put your first name and a phone number. You can turn it into me. I'll be down here at the front, or you can leave it on your seat. And we'll come by and get it. Maybe for you, your next step is baptism. You see people baptized multiple times on a Sunday. And you've said yes to Jesus, but you've never followed in believer's baptism. I invite you to fill out the card. Let us partner with you and tell you what baptism is and how special it is. It's an outward expression of an inward, what God did in your heart. God, I thank you for everything you're doing in the life of this church. God, keep moving. Protect us as we travel, as students go to camp, Lord. As people are on vacation, Lord. God, thank you for what you're doing here today. All God's people said, amen.